But right now, we're pleased to have with us James Nolan, who is the co-author of this book, Illinois Politics, A Citizen's Guide. Mr. Nolan, we've been, over the course of the last day and a half, we've been talking with quite a few people about Illinois politics, and they seem rather special. Um, how is it that corruption seems to be such an issue in Illinois politics? Is it unique? It's almost unique. Corruption has been a tradition in Illinois since the 1800s. A tradition? A tradition. Uh, you can go back to the buying of the U.S. Senate seat for William Lorimer in 1909 with $100,000 split among 40 state legislators. And during the Capone era, of course, uh, honesty was eccentric in many circles. Uh, and since 1970, there have been 1,500 Illinois persons uh, convicted of public corruption crimes. Now, is that a, is that a result of uh, the way the system was set up? Well, the system, uh, no, it's, I think, a cultural uh, tradition that we have in Illinois. When, you, when many Illinoisans look at government and politics, they say, where's mine? And so the tradition is one in which our political cultures uh, tolerate corruption. And uh, rare is the person who goes into politics planning to be corrupt. But once inside, uh, many people do as others have done before them and uh, find that maybe taking advantage of the system works to their advantage. Uh, it's, a, it's a cultural tradition. In reviewing your book, Illinois Politics, A Citizen's Guide, I saw that there are 6,000 different units of government in Illinois. We have more units of government than any state in the nation. We have townships, we have almost a thousand school districts, we have of course several hundred uh, municipalities, and we have thousands, uh, literally a couple thousand special districts for parks and swimming pool districts and that sort of thing. So yes, we, we are blessed with uh, quite a bit of democracy in terms of our local governments. And how does that affect Springfield and the state legislature? Well, all of the local governments are, have strong lobbies in the state legislature, and so trying to trim the numbers of governments is almost a non-starter in Illinois because the township officials and the county officials and the special districts, including the park districts, all have strong lobbies that uh, are for the status quo in Illinois. What's the governor's role in the state, um, and is it a powerful governorship vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state legislature? The governor of Illinois is one of the strongest governors uh, among our 50 states. Uh, he or she has uh, several veto powers, the regular veto, the line item veto, the reduction veto, and an amendatory veto. So. A governor becomes almost a, a quasi-legislator because of all of the veto powers which, which he has. How is the budget created in Illinois? Well, we, we have a pretty loose budget at the moment. It's created uh, traditionally by the governor who presents a budget to the legislature in the spring and then the legislature would uh, amend and make changes according to its values and send it to the governor who then would have an opportunity to impose the line item or the reduction vetoes. But in the past couple of years when Illinois has been facing a 13 billion dollar deficit in its uh, budgeting, the, the process seems to have fallen apart because in Illinois right now we have uh, about 30 billion dollars in uh, expenditures for our for our government but we have only about 22 billion dollars in revenues to pay the pay the bills so we're in crisis right now um, when it comes to the state legislature are members term limited how are they elected do they uh, how long are their terms is there anything unique about that no, there, is no, there are no term limits in Illinois. In fact, the Speaker of the House has been in the legislature about 40 years, and uh, he is clearly the numero uno in terms of power within the legislative system. We have a, a system in which power is centralized to the leaders of the legislature, and uh, the, the Speaker of the House, Michael Madigan, has developed great skill over the years and has accrued significant power, which he uses to help his members and to build majorities, which the Democrats have had 
uh, rather traditionally in recent decades. Because of redistricting or because of weak GOP or what? A combination. The, the Republican Party has been weak, but redistricting has benefited the Democrats in the past uh, 30 years. Primarily the Democrats have benefited from our unusual system of redistricting. And so the House has about 70, has 70 Democrats and 48 Republicans. So you can see that there's a significant majority in behalf of the Democrats. And it's a similar breakdown in the Senate. What's your experience in state government? Well, I was a legislator back in the late 60s and early 70s. And a Republican? Republican. From where? From the little village of Toulon near Peoria in central Illinois. And uh, then in 72, I was the Republican candidate for lieutenant governor, uh, the invisible candidate, I might add. That's not a very uh, uh, high-profile office. Right. And then you also worked for several... Republican governors? I've worked for three unindicted Republican governors of the state of Illinois. Which ones? Uh, Dick Ogilvy and Jim Thompson and Jim Edgar. Now, Jim Thompson served for four terms as governor, and, and he was a Republican, correct? correct? What is he doing these days, and how did he manage to serve four terms and not get indicted? Well, he was a prosecutor himself, and uh, so, and he was an honest governor, and uh, he uh, could have been elected to a fifth term, but decided to retire. He was not uh, under fire. In fact, he, he and Jim Edgar both left office uh, with significant uh, popularity among the Illinois voters. And Jim Thompson now is retired from being the chief executive, if you will, of a, a major law firm here in Chicago, Winston & Strawn. Well, in your book, you also look at the issue of Chicago versus downstate. Walk us through that. What's, what are the dynamics of that relationship? Well, since World War II, Chicago has declined in relative population from about half of the state's population down to 20%. So only one out of five of us is a Chicagoan. But Chicago still is the uh, strongest player in our regional politics among the city the suburbs and downstate. And that's because the media are here, just as you're here uh, this weekend, and the uh, money for major campaigns is centered in Chicago, and it's simply easier for uh, logistical reasons for political power to orient itself around Chicago. Basically, the state capital has moved to Chicago because all of the state off of officials and most of the legislative leaders and state agency directors work out of the Thompson Center in, in Chicago. So, uh, really? So Springfield, uh, except when the legislature is in session, is basically a tourist town. And so does that give, in your view, disproportionate power to Chicago? Well, all of our five or six statewide elected officials are from Chicago, and uh, the two major legislative leaders are from Chicago. So that gives you a sense of the locus of power being in the city of Chicago. Does that cause resentment downstate? It creates a lot of resentment downstate. Uh, for example, uh, Governor Blagojevich, ex-Governor Blagojevich, did not live in the mansion uh, in Springfield, the governor's mansion, and that sparked a lot of symbolic uh, resentment among downstaters who can see power having been eroded to Chicago and the metropolitan area. But there's little downstate, and I'm a downstater, can do about it because we are spread from uh, a latitude equal to that of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, down to one equal to Portsmouth, Virginia. So we're spread out, and it's hard to organize the one-third of the state's population that lives downstate. Is there a chance, in your view, that the state capital could ever move from Springfield? No, I'm certain that it uh, would never be moved. Uh, but uh, de, de facto, I think uh, Chicago is the, is the operating capital of the state. What do you want people to get out of your book, Illinois? Is this a, a kind of a, a walk through how to find what you need in Illinois politics, or is this more of a I think we should do this. 
No, it's more of the former than the latter. We try to explain the dynamics of politics in Illinois. Uh, we look at the major institutions, of course, the executive, the legislature, and the courts. We also try to provide some perspective as to the state's history and what brought us to the present point. Uh, but I think if, if there's a focus in our book, it is on the tradition of corruption in Illinois and how it is a cultural phenomenon that uh, won't be, it won't be eliminated e easily or quickly.